Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Political Punks. I'm your host, Brett R. Smith. Let's welcome our guests. Joining us today, Lisa DePasquale, Jesse Kelly, Terry Shepard, and Matt Palumbo. Okay, first off, I just want to say this show is not going to exploit or take advantage of the spill that Joe Biden took yesterday. Okay, that's not who we are. I'm kidding. Of course we're going to fucking take advantage of it because it was fucking hilarious and it was like the ultimate fucking wipeout of fucking wipeouts. I mean, this was out of control. The huff and puff, which blew Biden down. Okay. Um, I assume everybody saw this. We did. I, I sure did. <laughs> oh, yeah, what did I you saw. think? <laughs> right. I, you know what? It, it's so hard because I think we all have known someone you know, who's 78. And the problem is, is he, they're, they're gaslighting us into making us think he's not 78. Just embrace it. You're an old man. Talk, you know, be Reagan, like talk about going to bed at 6 PM, but instead they're like insisting this is some virile young man who's healthier than Trump. And, you know, it, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's tough because like on one hand it's, you know, not funny when an old man falls, but on the other hand, it kind of is. So yeah. are we supposed to well, it would be so much like, easier for them if they were just like, oh, yeah, that was, you know, embarrassing. Instead, it's just like you're an awful person if you laugh at this thing that 99 percent of people laugh at. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, but, a, there's a cottage industry of showing videos of people busting their ass. I mean, like America's funnest moment. Like those are the best videos. I, I would laugh at any of you if you fell. I would laugh if, you know, you're gonna laugh at me. I mean, I get it. It's the, pre there, you know what I guess is pretty funny was the righteous indignation from the people who were mad at the people who were laughing at it. Like you were, you know, everybody piled on Trump. People seem to forget the awful stuff they said about Reagan and everything mm -hmm. else. It's like. It would, it would have been good instead of getting to the top and doing his like dramatic salute. He just should have probably turned around and went like this. Yeah. Like the first time you should have done like a thumbs up. Like I made it like make fun of yourself instead of like, I'm, you I know, think this, probably this guy because is, he's expending I mean, he's, he's so, a lot of cognitive energy to look I, presidential. I'm the only one who's totally torn on this whole thing because I, 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 I would rather, I mean, I would, if Joe Biden was marched out of the White House in handcuffs tomorrow and thrown in prison for the rest of his life, him and the rest of the communists, I would be cheering and think it was the greatest thing in the history. Of America. That's how much I hate these people. At the same time, I can't set aside the old man falling part of it. Like I would want, I would wish every ill on him imaginable, except I see him falling up the stairs and I don't like it just because he's old. But yeah, I'd love to see Shepard fall up and downstairs. That, that I would love. You know, I've you know, done that. I've done, first of all, okay, let's just get this all out of the way right now because Jesse Kelly's on the show. So I'm going to do this before we forget and it gets pushed under the rug. Okay, I'm happy you're here. The other thing is that, Jesse, I have to give you credit because it's been a, uh, a year to slow the spread. And back in March a year ago, uh, you, dude, you called it. And yeah. I thought, man – does he is he really think that? But dude, you were freaking right, and you've been right about it the entire time. And the other thing about you is like you say the most effed up stuff, like about your sons, which is hysterical, like the robot competition in the basketball games, the WNBA, Italians, pretty much everybody. Nobody is safe from you, and the insults fly. And the funny thing is, when they come back at you and go, "You're an idiot," Jesse says things like, "No, I've got." community college credits or like, <laughs> like you just and the thing is you've done this right because you really you go right back at them and you don't apologize the problem is that you're nobody and so it would be great if like you were like the leader of a corporation uh you know someone who had athletic ability like a football player someone who was actually entertaining like a singer or a movie star mm -hmm. or even a high level politician but you're Jesse Kelly so no one's no one really gives a shit, but I do commend you on your behavior. <laughs> you know, that means, honestly, it would mean the world of what you just said. If I could, if I could hear that from somebody I actually respect, that would actually mean the world, for, the world to me, the world to me. But instead it came from Terry freaking Shepard. So honestly, that would be the equivalent of me walking out to my, to get my garbage can and bringing it back in and having a dung beetle say the same thing to me. I would be just as flattered as I am right now. 
Oh, I, just, no. I, just, I just looked at the Lego tweet. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's, like, that's perfect bait for like the, all the shittiest people. <laughs> oh, just it's but but no, honestly, Jesse, you you do suck. But I, it's you're, it's so good to watch you do this, and you really, I, I do think that you've got the template. And I just think if there were some other people who had balls who could like, you know, who were like in charge of a, a big company or something like that, this could be put down. A lot of this could be wiped out within a couple of days if everybody was like you, but they're not. And they, and that kind of well, sucked. Well, I mean, to be frank, if we have to hand out compliments to people we really, really don't want to hand them out to, you have balls. You've been a Green Beret for like 9,000 years. And within the Green Beret community, Terry Shepard's a legend, which tells you all you need to know. I don't have balls. I'm a sociopath. I, I mean, I'm dead, dead, and I'm, de I'm dead serious about this. I, I, I have good friends that tell me I am. It's not balls. I, I People will say all the time, oh, I don't care what people say, but they clearly do. I do not. I don't really care yeah. about anything. I don't get too high. I don't get too low about anything. That's part of being a sociopath. And right. therefore, I love torturing these communists because I despise them. And I don't play defense. You don't call me a Nazi and expect me, no, look at all my black friends. I'm going to call you a pedophile. I'll sick my 250,000 people on you. If I find out you're trying to cancel me, I will cancel you instead. I don't play defense. Our side that's is right. That's the right. That's the absolute right. That's the right attitude. If we had more of that, I think a lot of this could be put to bed pretty quickly, but we don't. You know? Oh, it would be. But what we have now is we have all these people who are worried about – uh, social media cloud and too many people being mean to them on Twitter or something like that. And not enough people who are aware that we are in a cultural fight that is life and death. I mean, eventually this comes down to life and death and you are either going to defeat these scumbags or they're going to defeat you and they're going to kill you. They are. Yeah. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to use, you know, I'm not trying to be dramatic. They are. You better win. We better win. Screw these people. I'm not backing down. I'm starting to get like, a, I'm like, I think I'm turning into Breitbart and then I'm starting to like get a high from all the hate I get finally. Like someone's always <laughs> saying they hope they don't reproduce and I'm like, good. Like I, I, if you wanted me to, that would be the, that would be the worst thing. Matt, I said the same thing after Rush Limbaugh died, and I was trying to lecture our side about this. Rush Limbaugh dies, and of course you have a whole bunch of people on the left. Oh, it's a great day. He's burning in hell and whatnot. And our side was freaking out about that. Oh, this is terrible. How can you say that? No, no. You should be making sure they're having parades the day you die. The day I die, I want them popping fireworks. And, they, and when they do it, don't anyone on this screen feel bad for me either. Just know that's what Jesse would have wanted. Just know that I'm looking in from the afterlife and I'm laughing my butt off. Nice. Honestly, dude, you know, the fall with Biden, you know, considering he busted Trump's balls over walking down the ramp so slow back during the campaign. That's why I laughed at this. Oh, I just yeah. figured, you know what? The gloves are off. If, if they're going to bust Trump's balls over this and holding the glass of water and all these brain damage from COVID, you know what? Then, then fair is fair. And, you know, what's good, what good, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And I'll bust. Well, and it's not even just about like Biden's reaction or, you know, the White House's reaction. It's that the media makes itself so obvious that they will cover for him for anything, you know, anything that anybody can see with their own like two eyes. Yeah. It's going to be, uh, we were saying before Jesse uh, figured out when he was going to be on and, and, and dialed in, but we were going to, I mean, it's going to be, it sucks because the country's getting shredded. Uh, but there is an entertainment value to watching the media just cover this and just really say everything's fine. I mean, it's like there's, you, we're, we're watching this in real time and they're saying things like, yeah, he had a spill, but he's, you know, his, his uh, approval rating is up. And everyone's like, is, is there, has there ever been a, 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 a profession, at least at this point now, that is really just talentless and just lazy. I mean, they're just throwing it in at this point. I mean, they're just, they suck. They're, but it's funny. It's kind of funny. Well, dude, the White House, the White House claimed that it was a gust of wind which took Biden <laughs> down. And that doesn't necessarily inspire any confidence considering how frail and weak he looks on a day-to-day -day basis. And it didn't look windy up there. No, look, I mean, look, the, the media is taking uh, their model from Kamala Harris and that you just cover yourself in filth to get to the top. <laughs> well, the other thing is, too, it's, Jesse, you uh, notice there's a lot of Did you guys see guys, the Hill as well? The Hill guys, reported on this because Donald Trump Jr. Uh, uh, of, oh, sorry. He shared a video of uh, that somebody edited together of his dad, of, of Trump hitting a golf ball and, oh, and yeah, yeah. smacking Biden think, in the back I of the head. Too, right? What's that? I sent you something too. You can put up. It's uh, uh someone tried to politicize it and it backfired. Uh, 
probably. Well, I, it's just amazing. I mean, the, the Hill actually reported on that. Just you know, the incredible investigative reporting over there at the Hill. I mean, as if we didn't know that that was. Doctor, well, I think. A but, meme. To Jesse's, but to Jesse's point about the 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 the, the battle. One of the problems we have is that I know there's a lot of guys in our camp, you know, conservatives and military guys that are like, hey, I, I know it's Biden, but, you know, I never I, I always root for America. Yeah, I get what you're saying, but you realize that Biden's not rooting for America. So it's like you could you're, you're defending a president that just wrote like 40, 40 executive orders, 10 of them or 12 of them dealing with illegal immigration, which is causing our, our border crisis right now. And I'm just thinking to myself, you, in order to get respect for being the American leader, don't you have to be kind of pro-American? And I just, I don't know. Like, I well, feel like our guys are so, our guys are so always doing the right thing that while you're doing the right thing, you're getting shivved in the back. Well, That's our, such white supremacy thinking though, Terry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we, we have, and this is human nature. It actually speaks to how, I mean, our side trying to, like you mentioned, do the right thing. What we have is a real mentality problem. And this is human nature. You don't want to admit how bad it is until the last possible second. And our side really, I mean, they genuinely, they want to just think this as well, Democrats versus Republican, maybe some higher taxes, maybe this or that, because it's hard to admit that the entire Democratic Party, half the Republican Party, the entire education system, all the media, uh, the FBI, the DOJ, it's hard to admit that every major cultural institution is now absolutely committed to bringing the United States of America to its knees. And that sounds extreme, but it's 100% true. All true. these people do everything they can to join with China, to dump on America if they can, but if you acknowledge that, if you really wake up one day and acknowledge that, that seems so overwhelming, it's easier to just deny it. You know, it's easier to yeah, deny yeah. it. No, everyone's not out to get me. I'm sure it'll be the midterms will make it better. Oh, no, they yeah. won't. No, you're right. You're right. I hate admitting you're right, but you're right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hey, look, let's let's move on to our uh, our B block. Purge commies from the military, not MAGA. You know, we got a lot of um, ideological purging going on, supposedly. Um, Top top brass are doing stand downs. We talked about this on the last show, um, you know. But at the same time, it's kind of like I was thinking, you know, is the military really totally compromised at this point, or is it basically just kind of like the top brass? Uh, the tip of the spear is like one percent. That's a very elite few. I don't know where they stand. Um, you know, kind of see where they vote typically. But you know, you know, why is an ideological purge on either side, right or left, a bad idea? Considering we have communist sympathizers within the military. Maybe we should be purging the military of communists, not America firsters or MAGA. Well, don't think for a minute that the quote tip of the spear uh, is not infected by this. I mean, there was a, the, like the SOCOM, there was a statement from SOCOM, uh, you know, and there's like, he's talking about diversity is our strength. And I'm like, I, I just, so I, you know, it, you, you used to think that it wouldn't get guys like us because we're supposed to be the masters of reality. Com you know, I've always said this, combat is the ultimate reality. And I I've said this before, you could be a left-wing guy before you went in the military in the combat in the combat realm. You might be one while you're in, very rare, and you could become one when you got out, but you can't look me in the eye and say that the left-wing principles work in combat because they're not, left-wing principles are constructs, they're fake. And so they don't work in combat. And so I think the other thing that, you know, guys like me and Jesse, we've I've always had a distrust of general of general officers because to get to that point, I don't even care, I don't care if you're a special forces guy, hard charging infantry dude or an intel or a support guy. You are a politician. We've seen it. There's there isn't a general out there. And, I'm, I'll, I, and I know I'm right. There isn't a general out there who would actually end his career for a soldier under his watch. Am I right, Jesse? I'm sorry. They're not going to do it. And so once you're in that, it is no different than the corporate world at this point. Granted, guys like us are on the ground. We're going to go, yeah, 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 cool. We got it. But eventually we do pay the price for that, you know, and, and it's, it's not going to be, it's not a pretty thing. And again, that sounds like, you know, oh, Terry, you're, you know, blow. no, it's, it's real. It's a real problem, man. Oh, well, well, I, I, I just have to throw this in. One, everything he said is right, which again that hurts. But two, you you mentioned you mentioned it's the top, Brett, and that's that's not 
that's not an uncommon thought, and it's not an uncommon thing that goes on out there. Well, it's just the guys at the top. It's just the guys at the top. Yeah, no, it's not. I, I want I want everyone to understand something. That's what matters because everything flows down from there. Even if it is the only guys at the top and it's not anymore now, that's your leadership. If 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 you ate at McDonald's every single day, which guys like Terry clearly do, if you ate at McDonald's every single day and you told me the general manager of the store, the assistant manager of the store, were telling everybody, all their employees, that they believe in spitting in your burger. But the employees don't want to spit in your burger. Would you still go to that McDonald's every single day? The leadership is what matters. I mean, the guys who are leading it are what matters. That's the problem. I talk about the cultural institutions, and I'll, and I'll complain about uh, the FBI. And people will say, well, the agents are, are great. Okay, what's that mean to me? If the director is a political hack and all his guys under right underneath him are political hacks, don't tell me about the greatness of the agent doing dangerous undercover work. I know that. He doesn't matter. The guy at the top does. Right, right. And the other thing is, too, because it is a career, because you're looking at – you're asking guys, and it's a tough thing. You're asking guys to go – if they step out of line – they will lose everything they work for. It doesn't matter that you went through special forces selection or you were the best in your class, you're the best. If you step out, you will lose your career. And it's the same thing with the FBI. I remember I said it on, on Gutfeld Show last year sometime. I go, by the way, I keep here, I don't want to hear it anymore about, you know, most of the people on the ground are good. I don't care. I, maybe they are. It doesn't really, that's not really what I see. And I was actually, I actually said, I go, I'm going to probably get in trouble. They're going to investigate me. I go, anybody from the FBI want to come back here and pull your reputation out of the toilet? Because that's where it is right now. You've lost the FBI and, and institutions like that, our intelligence capability, our intelligence apparatus, military in many cases. They've lost guys like me where I, you know, I think people like us generally reflexively defended those institutions. Like, yeah, they're, they're, they're trying to do the right thing. Yeah. I don't really feel that way anymore. You got a dude in jail for making memes, and then you got other people just be. You got guys who broke the law with FISA warrants, leaders of the FBI that are on you know on 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 shows and writing books and taking Instagram pictures, looking at the ocean, going, "Wow, what does this all mean?" I mean, it just no one's getting in trouble for that. So like. If they're not, if the people at the uh, top are not going to pay for it, then the people on the bottom are just going to get crushed. I don't care how good, I don't care how good a shooter you are, I don't care how tough you are, it will just destroy it. I mean, like my both of my parents are veterans, and it, but dad is a veteran, and it's just for people that haven't served that have always held you know the military up so high. It's just it's very uncomfortable. Yeah, you know, to, to think about it, to say anything negative about the military, because up until, you know, a couple of years ago, it was just one of those institutions that was always respected, at least on our side. I mean, and at least the, the average Democratic voter would still give it service, even, you know, like the Cindy Sheehan's were calling people baby killers or whatever. Well, that's by design. That's by design. I'm sorry, Jesse, I interrupted you, but no. I, I, I always talk before you because you're an idiot. I, that's by design because if the the military was a pretty a, a really a place of like real egalitarian meritocracy, but how how do you take down a country? Well, you got to destroy that institution, and 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 that's yeah. what's happening. It is, and 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 to Lisa's point, it's hard for people to criticize that. Like like military is exactly the same as doctors and teachers where you bring up the profession and it automatically just automatically you assign it a certain level of respect and what back to my point i made earlier about how people not wanting to accept reality you've got to stop doing that for all three of those professions we're coming off a year when doctors carpet bombed this not just this country the western world the, the, the doctors slaughtered the western world the teachers you love oh you're a teacher that's really great yeah they're teaching your six-year-old that they to hate america and then that military guy, if they're teaching. even guys who've gone done combat tours now, that military guy you love, yeah, he's against you now. He's not your friend anymore. He's not somebody you need to look up to. And those three things, because they're cultural like pillars, you're tri you don't want to accept that they're lost because if you accept that they're lost, that takes you to a whole different place and what that actually means. But when you accept it, things get a lot clearer. Yeah, I think teachers are the most self-important of any profession. Oh, 
<laughs> like, like they all act like no one can do what they do. And like, do you, do you remember the Norm Macdonald joke? He's like, yes. You know what qualifications you need to teach fifth grade? You need to be in sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yep. so far from the truth, you know. Well, and Nor they just spent a year trying to say like how essential they are when basically parents that are also working during the day or a computer is doing their job. Yeah. No, no, like McDonald's. We all like to think that our job is important in some way. I, I think I'm the only one in the country who actually goes on the air every day and admits my job means absolutely nothing. I talk into the microphone. It's the most unimportant thing in the world. My job is to make you laugh once on the way to work, and that's it. Everyone yeah. else wants to be told, oh, your job is essential, and you're a saint, and you're this. We're really not. We're all just cogs in a wheel. That's true. <laughs> That's true. That 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 Norm McDonald stand up is 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 really funny. It's on YouTube, but he he's he heckles a teacher in the crowd and he's like he's, yeah. and he's like he's like teachers teachers are the real heroes, not the police, not the firefighters, <laughs> not the first responders. Teachers, the people with the schedule of a child. You know? <laughs> <laughs> because I go to the grocery store and they have a sign and it's like we love our heroes at Wegmans and I'm like no it's not, but like being a cashier, this is not all that heroic. I just don't understand. Like they're all teenagers. What risk are they taking? Yeah, I mean, heroes. I think you know, my my heroes are like Chuck Yeager and the Mercury Seven. Very you know, hero I mean, for working that job. Isn't everyone shopping there also a hero because they're taking the same risk? I just don't get. <laughs> it's uh, it, you know, this this is just all par for the course these days with the culture. But you know, Jesse, you know, Jesse's, but Jesse is. Uh, Jesse's. I mean, this is all by design. I mean, what you're seeing right now is de is the is the fruit of decades. Yeah, decades of of you know, like you know, people are joking about oh, well, the Red Scare. They're, actually, that's real. They actually infiltrated our schools. The people that you saw protesting in in the '60s are now running shit. They run corporations. They run schools. They're in charge of everything. And so you have deck. I mean, like, dude, do you remember when the Kavanaugh thing? A couple years ago, and he went to Harvard. Harvard law students, the best you can get, didn't go to school to protest because they said he was a rapist. You guys are learning to be fucking lawyers. Like, that's aren't you supposed to sort of wait till you find out if he's guilty and and or defend him? Like, he's a Democrat. These are Harvard law students. Yeah, and but they, I mean, they let in David Hogg. So I feel like they've oh, sort of been I, uh, the downtrain for a while. I've got some updates on David Hogg for oh. uh, a segment. <laughs> Please, man. Oh, yeah. So uh, a few weeks ago, Hogg gave an interview with the Washington Post where I, I guess they had to rush get a lo like rush create a logo for their company um, before the interview because they they weren't even that prepared. And then they revealed in the interview they never hadn't registered a company yet um, or any trademarks. But, okay. Lisa, are you doing laundry? Are you doing laundry right now? I mean, I'm happy to be here, but things gotta get done. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I was gonna go re register an LLC in his name and the trademark, um, but for some reason, the government's website is is off, like offline during the weekend, and uh, an employer identification number. So I waited till Monday. Did all my work. Was finally gonna register, and someone beat me to it by like just a day oh. or like a couple of hours, but. It doesn't cost. I was I, I was going to invest five hundred dollars to this troll. Someone else did it for me. So <laughs> start the company now. So if you Google like David Hogg, my pillow, there's all these articles about how they can't actually launch the company they're trying to launch. <laughs> they <no longer laughs> and he, and their Twitter his reason for like taking a break. Didn't he say I'm going to take a break for a while? Was it? It's been a month. Time? It's been a month and a week, and there's not been a single update on the site. <laughs> The Twitter or anything. So Poor I think. Poor camera hog. Yeah. yeah. Poor you know, it, that name is so wasted on that loser, too. <laughs> because you know how much fun I would be if my last name was Hall? <laughs> I'd be giving myself all these nicknames. There was a doctor in Phoenix. I think he was a cosmetic doctor or something like that. And he used to have billboards up, and his name was Dr. Alcock. And I thought that guy was the luckiest dude in the world. I would be handing out business cards at 15. I went to Ranger School with a guy named Sergeant Pogue. <laughs> oh, dude. Oh, he was just, I mean, the R I, he shows up and the RIs are like. <laughs> That's for real? That's for real. 
His name was Pogue. His name was P O P O G U E. His name was Pogue. And was he? Pogue means. Oh no no he was a Ranger. No he was he was a Ranger student. He was. Uh, everyone doesn't know what that means, man. Good grief. But spend less time in the tattoo parlor and more time explaining things to people. Pogue means person other than grunt. It, it is, if right. you're in the grunts, nobody admits it, but if you're in the grunts, you look down on virtually everybody else everybody. in the world. Yeah, yeah, everybody if else. Not, if, if, you're you're not a gun, if you're not a gun, if you're not a gunslinger, I mean, we get it. Well, we okay. We every there's all sorts of jobs in the military, but if you're if you're not like one of the guys that goes and actually gets into gunfights, we call you a pogue. So imagine uh, showing up to Ranger School, Sergeant Pogue. There was also a guy. I can't remember if it was basic training or if it was in if it was another school. And his name was Sergeant Gay. <laughs> Which I again, I was just like the instructors to see that they're like this. <laughs> oh, over here, that Gay. reminds me. Something you said earlier. But don't I wanted you feel to like that guy Perry. has to be pretty uh, tough because he's already made it to that point in life without? He probably is. Yeah. He probably is. Something Terry said earlier I wanted to hit on is people, and I don't like telling people to read books because nobody likes to read books, but it blows me away how many people have not read the book Sword and Shield. It's about the KGB and what they did to get involved in the United States system and how deeply involved they were in the system. People think when you talk about communists today, they think you're some kind of nutball. The Soviet Union not only did this, we have multiple people who laid it out. This is what we did. This is how we did it. And they, they, they put this into all of our institutions. And now we're so far removed from them running it because the Soviets are gone. Now our system just teaches it on its own. And so even the people teaching full-blown communism would never say they're Soviets. They've never talked to anybody in the Soviet Union. This right. was all put in back in the 50s and 60s on purpose to destroy the country. And it worked like a charm. It's actually one of the cruelest things in the world, but the Soviet Union fell and all the guys who engineered it are never going to realize they succeeded. They won, they did it, it just took longer. Yeah, yeah. someone wrote the other day, they're like, I'm starting to think we didn't win the Cold War. We I didn't. Like, we we didn't. didn't. I don't think people we realize how far left our country is culturally. Uh, like I saw, I saw um, Pew did a poll the other day and it was, ranking people's views and diversity. And it was very, very vague, like just generally, I think diversity makes us stronger, whatever. And more re Republicans agreed with that statement than leftists in Europe. And that, I mean, that was just, that's always just one yeah. question. But like, you know what? I think we sort of lost the culture war by, uh, I mean, it's, I was, oh, but, uh, it's the quite exact a opposite. Diversity doesn't make us stronger. Assimilation makes us Correct. stronger. Assimilation like, makes us mean, Americans. If you mean diversity of ideas, obviously, yeah, then the best ideas will win. But if you just randomly mean let's have different people for no reason, I, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah that was about that was about the French. I think the French were set, even the French left is like, Americans are idiots. The American yeah. left. Is yeah, idiots. Europe's way left, like fiscally compared to us, but socially, I don't. I, I think uh, in some areas they're more on the right. Um, I, mean, I think I got immigration and those kind of issues. They're more on the right. Um, but well, you know, you know, uh, you know, Jesse, you're saying people don't like to read books, and that's very true. Um, they do like to read graphic novels, though. But um, <laughs> I, I, I discovered Yuri Bezmenov back in 2016. Some uh, a buddy of mine turned me on to him, and ex KGB. Defector. This guy predicted everything back in 1984. Um, he, you know, he calls it ideological subversion. He talks about how the KGB spent about 90 percent of their money on ideological subversion. The other 10 percent was on James Bond espionage and stuff like that. But it's really about infiltrating the institutions from within and subverting them. They take things that we hold valuable, like education or entertainment or the media. And they subvert it from within, which is, as Sun Tzu talks about, the highest form of warfare that you can wage is subversion because you don't have to raise a standing army. You can take down a country from within, yeah. wipe it out, and, and move in, essentially. It, and you nailed that. And, and I, I, I've, I've been trying to explain this to people, too, Brett, what you're talking about, because people get mad, like, like, like when they'll infiltrate sports or uh, the church or something like that. And then you'll hear people on our side say frustrated things like, why is it everything I love? That's why. It's <laughs> yeah. specifically because you love it. They don't, they, your military is a great example. Why yeah. the military? Why couldn't you just leave that alone? They couldn't leave it alone because you loved it. They go after the things you love on purpose. You brought up Sun Tzu. Genghis Khan used to do this all the time, the greatest conqueror in the history of the world. And everyone's picturing horse archers and things like that when you talk about Genghis Khan. 
Genghis Khan would send spies into cities months ahead of time. They would infiltrate. They would expand the ideological divide. They would exploit any divide they could. He had people opening the city gates for him by the time he showed up half the time. That's how you win wars, and that's what they did to us. Well, they, 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 yeah. After the Vietnam War, there was the, didn't they? Inter- I'm sorry, Matt. Uh, no, go ahead. After, after the Vietnam War, did I think there was a, they interviewed one of the generals, and he was talking about, you know, kind of their strategy and how they went about it. And they're like, yeah, we we knew we couldn't beat the American military, but we knew we could beat the American people. And that's yeah. what they and that's what they and, did. And the things they're infiltrating are just getting more and more pointless. Like I read an article the other day about how there's not enough diversity in hiking. And I yeah. see what in the photo they used one of the hikers is in a wheelchair. Right. Like, it's not hiking. It's just a guy in a wheelchair. That's off-roading, frankly. That's off-roading. Yeah. Like, God. Well, you know, I, you know, you know, Jesse, you were also this to people. The, the communists have never gotten to a place ever where they look around and say to themselves, you know, I think we have enough. I, I think we're good. Like, they can't never, do it. it they, they have never, to move forward at all times. So they never stop. They, they could never run a country, but they could infiltrate Teen Vogue. It's just so oh, weird sure. that they're, where their apparatus is. Well, well, what you know, if you don't like to read books, there are plenty of videos with Yuri Bezmenov on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Some of them are two hours. Some of them are four hours. It's worth sitting down and watching these because he explains all, you know, basically uh, the demoralization, the stages of ideological subversion that we have been going through. It takes anywhere from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. And you do that through infiltrating institutions, especially like education, where you teach the youth of a country to viscerally hate it. And, you know, a nation cannot stand if you teach the youth to hate it. It just doesn't work that way. And we see that with um, the millennials and the Gen Zers. Uh, Gen X didn't get too much of this. I didn't. I was also in some private schools. That's probably why. But public schools are just absolute. They're they're. They're contaminated with communists, plain and simple. But it's funny thing too. I, you know, what's funny about some about the street soldiers that are doing this though, the groups like Antifa and the other ones on the ground actually doing all this stuff. Do they really think they're going to have a seat at the table when the, when when the communists? <laughs> do you really think you're going to get you're going to have a say in this stuff? No, they're going to have their street sweepers come out and remove you like they've done. Every other historical precedent we've yeah. seen, so like Antifa, is just they don't even realize that they're being played. Like they're, you're, they're, you're, you are gonna, you are a useful idiot, and when it's when they're done with you, you're next on the chopping block because you're violent, you're unstable, and you're a threat. And guess what? They're gonna get rid of that. But they don't yeah, even and, 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 and they really need to learn. They they should go back and read about the Stasi and all these other groups. You know how nicely Antifa, Black Lives Matter, I need all of you to hear me now. You know how nicely the right treats you now? Trust me when I tell you the communists will not treat you said ways. They oh, will absolutely. not if, if you're lucky, you get shot in the back of the head and thrown in a ditch. If you're unlucky, you'll spend some time in a political prison before they shoot you in the back of the head and throw you in a ditch. You, our, you, our, you, you're used to these kid gloves. The communists don't play like that. Our country is so totalitarian, and Donald Trump was such a fascist. That they built a guillotine out in front of the White House and cut off an effigy of Donald Trump, his head. Do you think the communists are going to let you do that? Do you think they're going to let you do that? No, they're not going to let you do that. Hey, I, I want to I want to take it one step further because there are the useful idiots like Antifa and BLM. These are people who will just get swept aside after the takeover. But there's also the money people, the hedge funders. Yeah, these yeah. guys, these guys in America who have sold us out to China and the globe, these globalists in America who are money people, bankers, um, hedge fund guys, these guys all think that they're going to keep their money, too. And that's the funny part. And it reminds me of The Dark Knight Rises, where uh, Bane, the villain, uses one of the, um, uh, the hedge fund guys, like a big money guy, to buy his way in. And there's a scene where, uh, you know, you know, the, uh, the the money guy confronts Bane and says, I gave you a fortune and now you're turning on me. I gave you all this money. And Bane says, and and you think this gives you power over me? Mm-hmm. You know, and Bane, Bane basically breaks this guy's neck in about two seconds after that line. And that's exactly what will happen to these hedge funders and all these guys who have sold out America. Their fortunes are going to be gone. 
That reminds me. That reminds me of a real life story. Uh, there's a great book out there, Once Upon a Time in Russia. If anybody's interested in it, it's about the fall of the Soviet Union, and then when they moved into like this oligarchy, and then Vladimir Putin takes over. And Vladimir Putin, when he takes over, Russia had all these huge billionaire oligarchs, right? And here's this old KGB guy, whatever. He gathers up all the all the all, all the oligarchs and hauls them out to some secret bunker military base where he has all his old thugs around him, scars on their faces. I mean, typical Russians. They were supposed to be the most horrifying guy possible. And he calls all these oligarchs in a room and he says, all right, now I'm going to let you keep your fortune, but you're going to do what I want to do. Now, I know somebody in this room or more than one person is going to try to challenge me on this, but I want you all to understand. I want you to look around me. I carry a big stick and I'm only going to use it one time. You understand me? And he told them all. And of course, of course, two or three of them thought they were billionaire big shots when they left. And that's when you started reading the news articles about this oligarch found hanging from his neck in his shower on his yacht in the Mediterranean. And guess what? It all stopped like that. It's the guy who runs the military, who carries all the military. He's the one who's got the power. Facebook, what you like, get, get used to it, Facebook. Well, you, you yeah. remember the, the Russian oligarchs that were also dying of like poisonous sushi and they were finding radioactive material in the sushi? Wow. I mean, that's the same thing really right there. It yeah. was an accident. It was an accident. Well, you know, frankly, you know, you know, Putin really? just wished Biden good health. And frankly, if Putin wishes you good health, hire a fucking food taster. OK, that's all I got to say. All right. Let's uh, you know, why, why don't we move on to uh, hey, hi, everybody. Uh, our, our this is the most hit I've ever seen. <laughs> What's that? Get out so of that's here. most of someone else I've ever seen next to Jesse. <laughs> hey, um, let's move on to uh, Kanye. This blew my mind. Uh, Kanye West has become the richest black man in all of American history. He's worth six point six billion dollars. Uh, you know, I find this amazing, frankly, for a number of reasons. One of which it happened under Trump, and also uh, Kanye's a Gen Xer, which I find really kind of fascinating because he. He's, he's a year younger than me. We grew up basically in the same culture of the 80s and the 90s. We also grew up with Oprah. She was also the richest woman in America for a time. She, she's clocking in right now at about 2.7 billion. And that's, you know, that, that's a tidy sum. So twice in our lifetime, we've seen two black Americans become billionaires, which is, I think, pretty extraordinary and, and could only happen in America. I just became a gold digger. So what, um, Someone had an article from like I think it was six or seven years ago, and it was sort of like the, the ten. So I, I didn't put two and two together, there. <laughs> um, but it was like the article was like the ten craziest Kanye quotes, and they quoted Kanye saying he's going to be a billionaire, and they like mocked him and were like, "Oh yeah, we'll do it then." <laughs> and now I think he said he's like six point six billion or something. So it was a job well done there. Yeah, yeah, and well, and he's doing it like not in the traditional way. I mean because he's like doing it by blowing up old, like in his world, old institutions, you know, like posting old um, record label contracts, doing like his own contract and saying, you know, this is how we're gonna sign artists. It's gonna be like a one pager. You actually get to keep the rights to your creative, um, you know, things like that. He's doing things um, like put, he's kind of going like the non-fashion fashion route where it's just like, here's a $300 sweatshirt, people are buying it. And the genius of it is like people are buying it and there's no way of like flexing saying like this is a Kanye sweatshirt. I mean, you could do it with the shoes and stuff, but he's spreading, he's spreading the wealth so that, I mean, sort of like the lesson that a lot of conservatives are taking is like, don't just put all your eggs in YouTube or something, because when that goes, then you go. And just like he can have, you know, the record label, they've tried to cancel him just for liking Trump, but the people keep buying whatever he's selling. Right. Now nah, that just can't be right because America is racist. So that's that's obviously a lie. Yeah. He must be poor. That, yeah, he's the outlier. That actually reminds me, Terry. That I, this whole thing reminds me of who I have always said is the best example of the cultural Marxist in America America today, and that's Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey is worth billions of dollars. I, there was an old story, I don't know if she still does this, she used to take a helicopter all over Chicago to the various helo pads on the skyscrapers to get around to avoid traffic. Lives her life on private jets and yachts and everything else, and God love her for that world famous everywhere she goes. Can I take a picture, Oprah? And to this day, to this day, whines about America. America's yeah. racist, Wait, America's she, this, America's perfect that. to interview those two on, on Victor. 
That guys, perfectly yeah. epitomizes the cultural Marxist. All oh. these cool Brad athletes kneeling for the flag. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I, both, I know. Both Oprah and Kim Kardashian both have that shtick where they try to get, like, really obviously guilty people out of jail. Yes. All right, heroes for it. Like, yes. It's just, it's always the same thing too. One hundred percent of the time, all they do is repeat the defense's defense from like twenty years prior, and then just uh -huh. hope you didn't check to see it was all refuted back in the eighties. And then you go, "Geez, how did this happen? Oh my god, I can't imagine." I guess we're racist. I wonder if all those Biden staffers are going to call Kim now since they all got fired for Bro, using pot. Yeah, that's so stupid. That's such a, that's so funny. That's such a boomer thing, Biden, you know, basically booting them all for pot. You know, what's funny about Oprah is I, I, have, I have a buddy who worked for Oprah for, um, he's a friend of a friend, friend of my brother's, worked for Oprah for 25 years. He was her chief lighting engineer, worked, worked with her from the very beginning of the show uh, and up until about 2004 when it was kind of at its apex. Um, and I asked him, I said, what's it like working for her? And he said, well, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty good. I said, the pay must be great. And he goes, well, we're all independent contractors. That's, that's how, you know, and he just said, frankly, she's cheap. You know, she keeps everybody on independent contractor status. So she doesn't have to pay health care or benefits or anything like that. We get basically just a salary. You know, we're all, we're all just basically work for hire 1099s. And that's part of how she's made her money. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's probably smart business, but this idea that Oprah is this paragon of virtue, uh, just because she gives people cars who come on her show is just a bunch of bullshit. Well, and she's the anti Kanye in that even if you don't like Kanye music or clothes or, you know, whatever else, he's a, you, at least to use his platform to help lift up the black community and, you know, and doing his, his songs and talking about his family, whereas Oprah is doing the opposite and basically saying, you can't be me. The system is not going to let you be me. I'm not a fan of Kanye or his music or his clothes. I've never liked hip hop in general. It's nothing personal, but his clothes remind me of like the Mugatu derelict line and Zoolander. You know, you kind of like figure out what homeless people wear and then you sell it at a 50% markup. That was, like um, one, that was like one or two seasons. It's not always like that. <laughs> Daryl what a great movie! I mean, the thing, the thing about him again, I'm, I'm not. That's not my style of music or anything like that. But I think what was interesting about him. Was it he just broke? He just he just broke out of the ranks, and of course, for that he was hammered, and that's the point. Like, yeah, if, if you don't think along the group think that 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 what you expect black people to think, whatever that is, you get hammered by. And it's funny because like all these white people are calling him stuff. Like <laughs> left wing white people are calling him like Uncle Tom, and I'm like, what what's wrong with you guys? Like I don't I, I don't, don't I don't care how he makes his money. I don't care what his political beliefs are. But it's funny that. That like the liberal white people are the enforcers of black culture. But they're the worst. I mean, the white liberals, the, the ones that are racked with all their guilt. Anyway, it's silly. I mean, again, I, I as long as, it, as, as as the curtain keeps getting pulled back, I do hope that people can sit, can actually go, oh, wow, that's really what this is. But I mean, kind of to Jesse's point, I think – I said this, you know, my, I, have, I have members in my family that were that are that are pretty far left and they're, and they're you know, they hated Trump. And I was like, dude, I, I, I don't I don't care about Trump. Like, I don't care if he's a jerk. I said, but the only way I think that they'll learn we can't because of the 40, 50 years of indoctrination and constant blasting of media and everything else. I think there's no way, and this is to kind of to Jesse's point, which is why he's, which is why even though he's an absolute nobody, he's successful, is that there is no convincing these people. You cannot reprogram them. You cannot reason with them. You can't lie. The only thing that's going to make them get it is if they put their hand on the hot stove and go, oh, crap. Like when I told my brother, I said, Jack, you know, because he's, he's kind of a left, left wing guy. He's not crazy. But I was like, Tom, you, you realize that energy price, like, how is how was uh, Trump Putin just look at it again from uh, he's Putin stooge would Putin stooge make the U.S. energy independent which hurt Russia badly yeah. would Putin stooge liquidate Russian mercenaries in Syria no I probably wouldn't do that so I I go just with, when the I guess what I'm saying is the only way you're going to learn is if you go through pain and I, I remember I said something about that and people like well that's BS you know how can I'm, I said I'm not happy about that, but I, I've gotten to the point where 
you ain't going to learn them until they actually put their hand on the stove and go, oh, that I just burnt my hand on the stove. Because you can't convince them. There's no, you can't, they've been so programmed to not think for themselves. And again, I don't give a crap about Trump and his personality. I, I want everybody to leave us alone and, and let people make their choices. But I just, the gas has got to get high. We've got to go, we got to get involved in some more conflicts. People, people aren't going to get off their asses unless they lose stuff, I guess. That's what it is. And, or, or they're, and they're or going they're at, at, at speed, so that's helpful. Yeah. Well, this is this is again. This is what Yuri Bezmenov said. He said the people that have been demoralized, the people you know, they've been basically programmed to um, react to certain stimuli in a certain way. And it doesn't matter if you show them all the empirical evidence. You you prove to them and you show them that white is white and black is black. They've been contaminated. There's nothing you can do. He said the only thing that you can do is re-educate an entire new generation of Americans to believe in Americanism and American patriotism. That's it. Yeah, I, I, I've used this example before on my show because I've heard him say that and he's 100% right and I see it all the time now. You still see it with somebody, I mean, okay, maybe right after coronavirus comes out, I understand. You still see people driving around by themselves with face masks on. Yeah. And, I, and I use this example that when I talk about the system and the system being something, it's the entire cultural system telling you one thing and it tells you everything that's a lie now and people get hammered with so much stuff they, if they do believe it they, if if you woke up tomorrow morning and every news program told you the sky is green you'd blow it off but then every sitcom on tv starts talking about the green sky and the movies have green sky in them and then you have uh people you trust in the military talking about the green sky the president of the united states green sky this green sky that green sky all your friends uh, the sky is green it, Everybody around you is talking about the green sky. You go, you go through this for enough time. It doesn't matter that you walk out and see that it's blue. All you, all you know is it's green. And anybody who tells you it's blue, you will call them a liar and be angry at them for trying to deceive you. That's where we are now. That there basic is. truths, basic truths. People think I'm outrageous. I don't take a single stance on a topic that would have been even slightly controversial in like 1995. That's true. <laughs> but, that's but true. You yeah, that's up true. Today, and you say men are biologically stronger than women. Therefore, women should not be in frontline combat units. You, that is the most basic thing that every military in the history of mankind has acknowledged. But today in 2021 America, that's somehow controversial because well, the system has broken so many people. They can't they can't be fixed. Well, the rules are changing, and we're not getting informed when they change. Like there was this, this uh, I guess, a scandal of the week was that black woman not getting the job at Teen Vogue because she said something insensitive ten years ago. And I remember, only like two or three years ago, there was this weird narrative that only white people could be racist. So I'm going, well, how does she get canceled if she's not white? Like it's just the rules. I don't really know who's keeping track of them or who's creating them at this point, but. Uh, it, it just seems like it's all. It's like who was saying? I think somebody said it's like Calvin Ball. It's just all made up, and and you know, as it goes along, and I think it's that way on purpose. Well, Matt, that's that goes back to what Terry was saying: is these idiots all think they're going to hold power, or it's not yes. going to come for them. Well, yeah. I've told the story many times. When Pol Pot's Communist Party took over in Cambodia, there were 22 members of the Central Communist Committee. 18 of them were dead after the first year. These communists all think they're going to have a seat at the table. None of you are. You're all no. going down, every single one of you. And you know what? Again, sadly, back to Terry's point, that's good. That's that's what it's going to take. It's going to take them getting fried for them to wake up and realize this was all a lie. Yeah. Until the next generation, then we have to restart yeah. all over again. with the You know, Jesse, I think Yuri did say that the only way that they will wake up is when they feel the boot, the literal boot of the communists on their neck as they yeah, march the them away. That's the only way. No way. Pain, pain and suffering is the absolutely best teacher. It was the best teacher in the military. It was the best teacher in life. It is the best teacher. When you lose something or, or something hurts really badly, you learn that. On it. On but a, on what a, did the last year tell us that? Oh, actually, maybe when the boot comes down, there's going to be a bunch of people that are like, "Thank you for saving me." <laughs> yeah. Some of my some of my favorite stories are the historical ones when these communist dictators take over in places like China and whatnot, when other central members of the communist party go down and the, the, the boots kick in the door in the middle of the night and you read the individual stories, whatever ones come out about it, the, the shock on their faces, the, the disbelief that 
I can't believe this is happening to me. It actually is happening to me. I love those. I get off on those. Those and then lights out. Oh, and then lights out. And then lights you know, out. Love, you know what? I love the photos, and there's at least a dozen of these where it'll be a business that says like Black Lives Matter, and then there was a riot the night before, and every single window is smashed. Yeah. It's, like, yeah. it's, it's it's the new Passover. Like you put all that stuff <laughs> just to hope that they avoid you, and it does not ever work out. That's good, man. Yeah. That's good. Well, it takes the place of. Like you have the people that have that, and then the people that have like the you know proud NRA member where Charlton Heston is yeah. like president, and so you know what houses to skip. I I still have that sticker from I bought I got that sticker in '95. I still have it on my scout. My president is Charlton Heston. That's a Clinton <laughs> era sticker. That Lisa, reminds me. Lisa, Lisa, did you get your did you get the laundry done? Is it all folded? Is everything cool? I mean, I I'm making my way through my chore list. Um, so we're halfway there. She's a I master. Start your bun. Why don't you come over and make me a damn sandwich? <laughs> She's a master at folding laundry. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It has nothing to do with her gender either. I mean, that reminds me. I'm gonna be. She's okay for a mouthy broad, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love that term, broad. We need to bring that back. You know that. Oh, used to be, that. That's a great term. term. That's like I a have tough, problem with it. A, a tough broad. You know, that's that's kind of what those things. I like things. that, and I like Dame. Like a, Dame. It's a tough Dame. Dame's a Dame. Great. I hope you would appreciate my appropriation of military. Uh, it says girl gang, but it's like military. I don't know if you, how you earn these. Yeah, 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 yeah kid. I was, Whatever. I was just distracted by something else. Anyway, <laughs> I want to I want to say something about Kanye really quick. Um, one thing I like about Kanye, and I think this is because he's a Gen Xer, he's not a victim. He doesn't subscribe to that victim chic mentality that we have today. Um, you know, all of us, aside from Matt, grew up with like Jordan, Bo Jackson, Whitney. <laughs> Still Cosby. growing. Yeah, I know. He's, exactly. Um, uh, you know, the '80s were rife with high-profile black celebs and high achievers. You know, and, and the common culture uh, celebrated winners in the 80s and 90s. We didn't celebrate victims like we do today. We all wanted to be like Mike. No matter, you remember that commercial where it was like the little Everyone king? Does. Dude, still do. LeBron sucks. I mean, Mike will always be the king. The king. Dude, how, I mean, like, was it at Columbia? They're having like six or seven different graduation ceremonies based yeah. on your. So Segregated. We're going back to segregation now. Is that that's what's going on? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody's got to divide into their niche so they can cool. feel special. You know. That's it's all good. Well, I mean, if y'all haven't seen it, that Ryan Long video of the oh. racist and the anti and the anti racist. Yeah, it's a classic. I agree. He's brilliant. He's brilliant. Ryan's doing great stuff. Everyone needs to subscribe to his channel because he's he's like one of the few guys in comedy that's funny. He is. Um, yeah. It's very rare. Yeah, exactly. All right, so all right, so last block. I asked, um, I asked everybody best military movies or series about Middle East wars. I'm talking Desert Storm to today. There's very few. Uh, I have my favorite. I wanted to get you guys. You know, we got a Green Beret and we got a Devil Dog. I'm I'm curious to what you guys watch or have watched and dig. Jesse, what do you like? I'm hoping it's something I always liked, that I, like. I thought I thought Hurt Locker did as good a thing, good a job as anything I've seen. That's what I thought. Okay. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna slam you for that a little bit. I do get that. I but I, I actually you know it was a good movie because I was in the first Gulf War. And uh, by the way, you're all welcome for your freedom. It ain't over till my buddies come back. But <laughs> yeah, what are you laughing at, Kelly? It's not funny. Uh, <laughs> but you know it was a good. You know it was a kind of a you know it was kind of a cool movie. It was Three Kings. That actually oh, yeah. was a yes. good movie yes. because George Clooney played a really good special forces guy because he had this little monologue where he was like, someone was talking about love. He, and George Clooney goes, that's all bullshit. He goes, you do what is necessary. And I was like, yeah, that movie. You know, and he had like uh, George Clooney's character had gotten in trouble because he was betting some like reporter or something like that. I was like, yeah. that's an a, SF. And it got, the whole, it got the whole vibe because they were wearing, you know, the chocolate chips, which I wore, and all that. I do think that it's an interesting thing right now. It's easy for for the, the the entertainment complex to make movies about going after Nazis and stuff, right? Because that's an easy target. But have you noticed in general, they don't really want to talk about the enemy that we've had to fight over there for 20 years because, again, that's culturally insensitive. We're not allowed to look at them as, you know, the enemies that we had to put in the ground. We have to put them in context and all that. 
the great the, okay the greatest generation is world war ii are we going to call those guys racist for calling the japanese guys japs are we going to call them racist for calling them krauts and jerry's because that was the enemy they were you have to look at them as an enemy and i think that unfortunately so much of the military movie making complex right now is not based on reality it's based on other military movies that have become this sort of learned base of culture and that's what they think the military experience is like vietnam movies are especially like that like you know they're based these these military these making these directors these movies they think that the actual military lexicon the military body of experience is platoon and apocalypse now those are movies that's not people were not smoking weed going on patrol in vietnam it just wasn't happening and i just i feel like you know it's easy to make the the nazi movies because those are our official approved enemies okay i got that but we're not we're not we're not to the point yet where we can touch our our islamic enemies over in the middle east because that is problematic well, so they I, won't touch it they won't touch it because look it's easy to make a nazi movie because you can name the bad guy they won't right. touch the, the middle eastern thing or anything else today because they think we're the bad guy the people well, making yeah, that's, the that's movies now point. they hate us you're, you're not the protagonist now i mean maybe you're the do-gooder for the bad cause but still i mean really it's america's fault in well, some hey, real quick about hurt locker I, 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 Hurt Locker, the best moment in Hurt Locker was when he went, when uh, uh, Jeremy Renner comes back and he's in the grocery store and he's the looking the around. The cereal aisle. The cereal he's aisle. He's lost because I, I, I think I've, I have sort of felt that before. I come back and I'm like, I don't even understand this anymore. My problem with Hurt Locker was that, and a lot of EOD guys, explosive ordinance disposal dudes, were really upset at that movie because Jeremy Renner, his character was on the edge and he was not seen clearly. And he was, yeah, he'd go up to a car that was maybe rigged with a bomb and he'd kick the door. Like, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think no matter how effed up you are in the head, you would risk your men's lives that way. It's I, a I, you bit, know what I'm saying? It's a bit maverick. You know, I know what like you're saying, but I choose to not be obnoxious when I watch movies, especially military movies, I, I and, ruin it, and ruin it for everyone else. Because I used to do this and be like, oh, that's not how it works. Oh, that's not how it works. He's holding that weapon wrong. Oh, that's not how you clear a room. Like, I, 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 I've just no, laid I don't all that aside. But don't, don't you grade like, the Hurt Locker like on a scale because it was directed by a woman? Well, yeah, that's what hurt it, really. Mm hmm. I mean, it, it would have been better if it was directed by a guy. We know this. No, and I agree with you, Jesse. I think there, there are some guys that are like, where is this trigger discipline? Shut up. It's a movie. It's a movie. Like, I, I don't, that really doesn't, unless it's really cartoonish and trying to tell me that it's not. If it's a cartoonish movie, then go with it. When you but watch it, the it, Rambo movies, he never shoulder fired a weapon. Yeah, <laughs> Everything sure. from the hip. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the, the guys who take that whole, it's not real, that's not right. I just, again, I'm just thinking, I just think I, that my only problem with Hurt Locker was I, I I knew a lot of EOD guys. I did a lot of stuff with those cats, and they I never knew any of them, and we were all effed up in the head. I never would know any of them that would actually do, like, take those kind of personal risks, yes, but where they would risk the lives of their guys, I don't think they would do that. That was my only problem with Hurt Locker. But, they, but the vibe, the feel of the place and everything like that, they definitely nailed it. Yeah, I, you know, I, I've said for a long time um, I'm not a fan of Catherine Bigelow. I, I don't think women – uh, direct good action movies. I just don't, I'm just not there. I don't, I think Christina Wong, who's worked on The Mandalorian, she's pretty talented. She seems to know how to do action, but Bigelow. <laughs> we lost him. <laughs> Am I, I back? Needed him. Just yeah, you needed him. Spot, uh, I got like no, a just... $20 Lenovo computer that hasn't frozen up yet, Brad. It's I know. He's hosting everybody. Well, one thing I wanted to say was um, yesterday was the anniversary of the land invasion of Iraq when uh, first recon, first Marines blitzkrieged into Baghdad and took the city in open top Humvees, which had never been done before. And it's not really something Marines do. But, you know, as Jesse would probably confirm, Marines never tell you they don't do windows. So I wanted to talk about Generation Kill, which is my favorite. Um, I'd probably say Lone, Survi or, uh, Lone Survivor, American Sniper. Those are kind of my two second favorite. But Generation Kill from all my from all my Marine friends who were not not Pogs, but Grunts, all say that that really captured what it was like, uh, not only during the land invasion of Iraq, but also just to be a Marine during that era. 
Yeah, it did, did a very good job. It, it did a very, very, very good job. Yeah. And I was ready for it to to not be good. I'm always ready for it to be cast in a bad light. I thought they did yep. I thought they did a very good job. It was it was short. It was made by the guys who did the wire. And um, you know, and, and they had Rudy Reyes, uh, they had um uh Colbert, they had Josh Ray Person, they had all of the real guys either acting in the film or as technical advisors. And I thought that also brought a real kind of tangible reality to it. It also sort of had sort of an over the shoulder of the camera. You know, you're in the Humvee with all the guys and you just feel sweaty and dirty and gross after a while. I mean, it, it really, it had a full kind of cinematic experience that I really liked yeah. and I thought it was really honest. And I loved all of the banter between all of the guys. And if you go back and you watch that today, dude, there is no fucking way possible on God's green earth that you could get that series made today. No, no, the dialogue no. is out of control no and it's hilarious, but it's awesome. This, by the way, to, to, to that thing, and Jesse, I, I, you, this is funny because Jesse and I, if you follow us on Twitter, we get into these things. We'll bait each other. We'll, there's mom jokes and really, really like sexual insult and all sorts of stuff. And he and I go at it. And then there's people who, have you noticed, Jesse, some people have come in like, hey, what's wrong with you guys? And they're like, <laughs> you clearly don't know us. Dude, you've, you've clearly never been in a barracks or you've never been, you've never had your, know, your balls in a dude's face while you're on a 50 cal. So it's like, I just, it's just funny, right? I mean, because the way we talk, I've said this before, it's, I mean, I don't know about the rest of the military, but like, but I know for the, for the combat arms, whether it's tankers and artillery and infantry guys and you know, I'm, I was an infantry guy before I was a special force guy the way I look at it is if you're not infantry everything is support for infantry even even the flyboys sorry it's all infantry even special forces are support for inf infantry but if you're not one of those those kind of, I mean like the shit we say to each other the things that we write Jesse the, oh. the the racial comments the, oh. the, the, the stuff that comes out of our mouth you would think we are terrible and the reason we talk that way to each other is because we love each other because because love is a decision it's a choice right it's not a, it's like we all I, I, there's dudes who you may not even like personally you know I, that guy's a dick but you guys make the you put your hands in the middle like we're getting we're going to kill everybody who goes against us and we're going to get everybody out of here alive and so and everybody has to pull the weight i think the biggest fear i know for me jesse whether it was an infantry guy or special force guy is am i pulling my weight will i will i fail my friends if stuff gets bad. And when you have that in the military, in the combat military, what kind of, off and this is what I miss. I've been out now since 2016. My office, I could walk into my workplace and everybody in that joint will kill for me and everybody will die for me. And they expect the same out of me. I should kill for them or I'll die for them. There is no other workplace like that. And so when you have that kind of work environment, there is no insult. There is, there's no insult beyond the pale. There is no prank. There is no harassment that is beyond the pale. And it's beautiful. And I miss it. I, mean, I, I do too. And that's why I, that's why I try not to change it. That's why I'll do that stuff with Terry in public. That's why I insult everybody. And, and I tell people, you need to be worried if I'm not insulting you. I insult, <laughs> I, I insult the people I love. You know, right. if, if I'm not, if yeah. I'm full lipped around you, that's because I'm out on you. The harder I am, the, the more you should enjoy it. And he's Absolutely. right. The racist stuff we said, the terrible things we said about each other's mom, it, it was stuff that would get everybody fired just for appearing on this screen with us back in the day because we yeah. loved each other and didn't care. And it was the least racially charged thing ever because of that. I mean, yeah. you could go up. I remember we had a staff sergeant one time. He was fresh off the drill field. His arms were like the size of my legs. He was the giant, scary human being. And he walks in, and the first day he's screaming at everybody. And I said, "Oh, staff sergeant, why don't you tell me why black people love Cadillacs so much?" And he looks at me, he glares at me, and he bursts out laughing. I thought he was going to shatter the windows. And it was, get over here, Kelly. And we just we were close to this day. That's and it. that's how you deal with these things like that. That that was how we dealt with that stuff. And in this world today, I, I don't relate to it. I don't like it at all. I talk about that stuff. Yeah, it's totally you know, true. You know, one of the ideas. things. One, one of the things in Generation Kill that I like so much was that it's kind of like Blazing Saddles. Everybody insults everybody, and therefore yes. nobody's offended. Nobody's <laughs> safe. Nobody's safe. Yeah. We are so. Yeah. If you expose a chink in your armor, if we if we find by probing you with insults, right, Jesse? 
if we find something that actually gets your goat and gets under your skin, we will keep hitting that spot. It's like it's like peeling. It's like putting a knife in a in a, in a lobster shell or in a, or underneath the, the armor of 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 a, of a knight. We're just going to keep sticking in that spot till you either break or just laugh. Yep. What the, the worst thing you can do is show them that it gets to you. The, <laughs> even even if it does, you better yeah. laugh along with it and move along because they're never going to stop that. And ever. hit right back. Like the best yeah, thing oh, yeah. you can do. The best thing you can do if someone insults you. Right back at him, and then all of a yep. sudden it becomes it becomes awesome, and, I, yep. and that, there's really there's no other there's no other civilian place. I have to watch myself when I go do my other jobs. If I'm filming, even when I'm on like a TV or something, I mean, like I get to curse a couple times here, but like there are things I will never be able to say. There are there's <laughs> behavior I will never be able to be again because I'm not in that world, and it was so liberating. It really I have is. to watch myself too. It, it happened to me a couple of weeks ago. One of the guys that works for me on TV is a Mexican, and uh, he, he, I get him. I, I buy the guy some food. I buy him some lunch sometimes, and he starts complaining about the queso. And I said, "What's wrong with the queso?" His name's Mitchell. And he said, "Oh, it's too hot." And I said, "Too hot? You're freaking Mexican? Are you kidding me?" And then it occurred to me, and we're all laughing. But it occurred to me, dude, you can't say that today, like no. that in that no. in this world. But that's just how we talked. That's how we yeah. always talk. But can't do that anymore. It's. I was, it's, in, I was in line with Chick Fil A, and I was with my roommate who's black, and he was like, he's never been there before. So I was like reading on the menu like things he would like, and I was like, yeah, you probably might like like the the spicy chicken sandwich. I think you can handle it. And he goes, why? Because I'm black. And I went, yeah. <laughs> like, Ten people in line just started laughing. Good for you, Matt. Good for you, brother. People can take a joke still. That's good. That's that, but that's also kind of. I mean, that's how my buddies in high school and college. We used to bust each other's balls yeah. all the time. Oh, I mean, that's yeah. how that's how Gen X and some of those early millennials, I think, talk. And, and I'd love to see Gen Z start to strip that away and just start to become unvarnished. I think that's some of happen. them do. Like my my nephews, when I was down in Arizona. They would talk about like when Trump was president, this is like, you know, a year or two ago, but they would talk about kidding each other on the bus and being like, um, you know, Trump's going to deport you or Trump's going to put you on the other side of the wall. <laughs> and it's probably their parents that are like, you can't say that. And I remember I showed them like one of my magic tricks. Um, well, the only magic trick that I know is not really like a magic trick, but it's sort of like a not safe for work thing. And like their parents were like dying laughing. And then they were like, wait, don't do that at school. <laughs> what is this magic trick you speak of? I'm just yeah. Kidding. Hey, y'all. I got a oh, roll. Okay. I'm sorry. I got to get out of here. Right on. It's good Thank to see you. you and uh, I continue to suck. He's gone. And like that, he was gone. All right, well, that was my magic trick? Yeah. Okay. Just a regular Kleenex, obviously. So. Make sure you see it. <laughs> I can't believe I just fell for that shit. <laughs> that's that's got to that's I, I got to make a clip of that. That was pretty good. Oh, okay. I, I gotta, <laughs> The presentation was good, though, Lisa. No, but I'll, I'll, I'll cut the clip off, like, right at the end or something. Like, you can't, you can't tune in to see what it was. I mean, I figured, like, I probably should have – I'm glad I did it because it didn't occur to me that saying, like, showing my nephew something that's not safe for work um, might be taken the wrong way. Yeah, especially these days, you know. So it's like every well, I mean, other week. Could, I mean, like, you could get – you know, literally, you can lose your job. I mean, there's stuff we put on the internet and said stuff, but it's like I, – I, I was talking to, you know, Jesse, like I said, I miss that in the military because we're – when it's when it's life and death and it's – you know, you have – all the bullshit gets stripped away. And so the only thing left is like real, real camaraderie, and real camaraderie doesn't really have those kind of fake construct bounder, uh, boundaries that hold you in. You know, one day, you know, and I think comedy is is the real barometer of how much freedom is in society. Because, like, you you'll know we are free when we have a comedian, a white comedian, who can make fun of black people as effectively and funny the way Dave Chappelle made fun of white people. Because when Dave Chappelle put makeup on and acted like, dude, I couldn't. It was really funny, and I was not offended. 
Like, yeah. but you can't, I mean, there's the, right now a white comedian could not do that. And so, and I don't really, I mean, it's not like I, I, I don't care, but I'm saying, I think it's interesting that as soon as people become protected classes, the freedom's gone a little bit. Like you can't, there, there's a, there's a lack of freedom. As soon as some people are, you can't touch them. Yeah. Until, and, and that's just the way it is. It, it, it is what it is. No, I think that, that's a brilliant observation that you can, that comedy is the barometer to how much freedom you have. And we're just talking about Generation Kill that could definitely not get made today just by way no of way. the, the, no the way. commentary that goes on in the background between the dudes. I mean, it's just in that first episode, it's just so out of control and it's so funny. Uh, I mean, they're talking about like, there's one, there's one line where they're talking about J-Lo and they're talking about uh, Puerto Ricans and one of the Mexican guys says, Puerto Ricans, they're like tropical Mexicans. You know, it's like stuff like that. It's, it's so funny. And, it, and it's the way guys talk. And it's also verbatim from the book, which is Evan Wright embedded with those guys. So, I mean, he was there jotting down notes, you know, so it's, it's real. It has that element. By the way, Jesse Kelly, Jesse Kelly wrote, I said, hey, it's great to see you. And he goes, yeah, you too, brother. How'd you like that Irish goodbye? Is that an Irish goodbye or is that a French goodbye? When that's an leaving? Irish. That's an I and I wrote I hate you. Yeah, I the Irish goodbye is just leaving, right? Irish goodbye, you're at the bar and you're all hanging out with your friends, and all of a sudden they look around and you're gone. And, and that's what they, you just pulled an Irish, is what that is. I thought that was a French exit. That I always thought that was a French exit, but it's an Irish. Don't exit. you dare take that from the Irish. <laughs> you I, 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 yeah, but, yeah, fuck the frogs. Uh, we yeah, don't have a lot. We don't have a lot, but we do have that. That's true. That's very true. You have Highlander too, right? Or is yeah, that Scottish? Do, uh, that's Scottish. How dare you? Right. 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 Sorry. Sorry. That's Gavin. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, do we want to wrap it up? Uh, I, Matt, I think you've got to be someplace, don't you? Well, Can I just I, point out that um, you promised that I could watch Generation Kill, and probably the best part that I know is that there's like guys wearing silkies. Well, well, Terry. You got Rudy Reyes wearing silkies. Rudy Jolly. Reyes. Rudy Reyes is a is a is a friend of mine. He's a really he's a legitimate. He's a nutcase, but he's such a good hearted dude. He's a I, really nice guy. And you don't you will not see him anywhere in picture without his shirt off. You just because he's just so he's so jacked, but he's really awesome. really a, really a nice guy, and he's very like he's very giving and stuff like that. He's just a really funny dude. But yeah, we. That's the other thing is like that's that's how we walk around in those little ranger panties we call them. Just you know. I, I, I have a pair that I work out in. They're very comfortable. They're they're, they're, they're fantastic. I, although I've never wear them outside of the house. Uh, but you know, Rudy, Rudy, they always they busted Rudy's balls in the show because they just call him Fruity Rudy because he's so right. good looking. He must be gay. They're just like you're so right. gay, Rudy. You know, uh, and that's part of the fun. They, I mean, they're always busting on him. But I mean, Rudy is uh, like a expert martial artist. The guy is like a. I mean, he's just absolutely jacked. Um, I got a buddy who takes pictures of him, uh, Barry Morgenstein. And, um, Does he know it? Ru Rudy is just way too handsome. It's just out of control. The guy's way too and handsome to be like a real him, Marine. The best part about him is he is a legitimately nice guy. Legitimately yeah. nice guy. Legitimately good person. Yeah. He seems really sweet. I I'd love to get him on here to talk. That would be a lot of fun. But um, I, I don't know how close you are with him, but maybe we can – I can reach out to him. Try yeah. for later down the road. He's not. He's not really particularly political, though. Not he's really. Not. No. Nah. Nah, he's I, not. No. Really I, I, I didn't get that out. I, I, you know, I'd probably talk to him about the show more than anything else because it was. Yeah, so yeah. He talk about a lot. He's he, he has he has a lot of things he could talk about, but he's not a politics guy. But he's a very very. I can't say enough nice things about him. He's a legitimately really good guy. Yeah. Know? Yeah, they, you know, a lot of those guys on the uh, the Blu-ray for uh, Generation Kill, they have uh, seven of them that that are interviewed in a, in like a little extra, and um, all those guys just seem super cool and really down to earth. I mean, they're just kind of salt of the earth dudes, you know. And that's obviously that's, that's what been my doing. experience. That's again what I miss about it, you know. Like I was, I had my own team in Special Forces for the few, uh, for years before I retired, and I, I did, did the, this the best guys. I mean, as and we're all flawed, and we're all. You know, we all are idiots in our own way, but just the, the nicest guys. And, and again, you know, these guys are killers, but they're like gentle. It's really hard. It's hard because it sounds paradoxical, but like they're the nicest guys. Like one of my best friends, Ernie Brown, and I, I, I give him a shit. He's, dude, he's an absolute killer, but he's yeah. the, the most gentle bear of a man. And he's he, he'll be there for you no matter what. So that's well, it. Isn't it yeah. kind of like when you when you sort of master or you study the art of violence or the action or was it the the action of violence or the violence of action? That's what it is. When you when yeah. you study that, and you own that. Um, 
you know, it's like the flip side of that is you can also become a very gentle guy because you have that that you can tap and into. You also have nothing, and you also have nothing to prove at that point. Like if, if everybody in the room is that way, if everybody in the room is trained and, and experienced in those sorts of things, the ego kind of gets put. The guys who don't put the ego down, they don't fit in very well. Guys who take themselves too seriously, take the job seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. And I think that most of the cats that, that are in my world like that, they're all very, very approachable and really nice people, you know? People, I when people that know that I know you, they think, oh, he's scary. You like those tattoos. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, like, we've, we've spent a lot of time together. You know what an idiot I am. I mean, so it's like, it's it's not, there's nothing to prove. Not that you're an idiot, but that you're um, a softie. I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, why, we, why be we text this, back and forth about Talking about dogs that we miss in crime. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that the other day. And and I just I just think again, but if even if you just get a bunch of guys like that together, there's an easy cut. I'll tell you one quick story. And I tell you this story, maybe I, I one quick story. So a few years ago, I was up for another project on History Channel. It was called like Ultimate. I, tell me, stop me if I if I told you this story. So I got hired to host this show called the Ultimate Soldier Challenge, and and it was a pilot, and it was I had uh, two guys that were Navy SEAL guys and two guys that were Russian Spetsnaz guys, and I was the host, and it was like you know they competing in head to head and all this kind of stuff. And the first competition bit was a this machine gun thing where they had a two forty uh, Bravo, and it was just like how to you know engaging targets behind a wall and 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 da -da. and of course the SEALs were trying to use this gun precisely. And you know, pick and the Russians, of course, just mowed down the wall and just <laughs> killed everybody. Because again, that wasn't really specified, so they just did it like a Beslan school thing. And but it was at the end of, of that of that bit, they brought us all together, and I was standing in front of the Na Navy guys were here, and the Russian guys were here, and we're uh, we're all just really having a good laugh, kind of busting on each other and talking about what happened. And the uh, the producer of the show comes up to me; she's this tiny little Asian gal. She goes, um. Terry, can I, can I speak to you for a second? And I was like, yeah, sure, of course. So she comes up to me. She goes, love what you're doing. Uh, it's really good. You know, she was, but I, it's kind of a little too, we need you to be more like a, a green beret. And, like John and, Wayne? Right. Meaning that, right. So meaning that I, they, they had this, in, they had this vision that I was going to be some sort of a drill sergeant, severe kind of tough guy host. And yeah. she says, I need you to kind of be more, you know, kind of a green beret thing. And the Russians looked at me and the SEALs looked at me and we all burst out laughing. We just couldn't stop laughing. And I, I could tell she just wanted to just evaporate. And I said, come here, come here, come here. I said, we're not laughing at you. I said, I just want you to know that if you want your audience to really get a glimpse into how we are with each other, you know, this is really how it is. This is There's a very easy camaraderie with people in our world that we don't have to, you know, put the egos on the table and, you know, measure our you know what's because we're not we're all past that right now so this is this is really how we talk to each other in, in intra-servicely and in, internationally with different guys i work with a lot of different you know international uh, special operations guys i said this is really how we are now if you want me to be a little more detached from them i can do that that's no problem if you want me to but i i I, I'm not going to be some sort of a drill sergeant kind of person because that's not how we are or who I am. And she was like, oh, okay. It was just funny when she said, I need you to be more of a Green Beret. And all the guys were like, ah, and they started laughing. It was pretty, did that air? Reception. Did that did that show air? Uh, I didn't, no, they did the, you know, it's funny. They We did the pilot and then I never heard from them. And then it they went with awesome. Well, they did it with some other guy and then it was, it didn't make it. It was like a season. So they didn't yeah. like me. I, Maybe I wasn't. I wasn't too. I was maybe that guy I wasn't, more green beret? You weren't green beret. Yeah. I guess. I guess they just wanted someone who was a bit more of a green beret. You know, or, or they wanted. They wanted early Emery. That's that's probably. You yeah. know, they, they they wanted Hartman to come in there and yell at everybody. I, but I just think that's funny that people's perception of how we are, and Lisa's. You know, you guys' experience of how we actually are is not the same thing. Not the same. <laughs> Not, not even on the shows, really. Not even on Dude, You're Screwed or, you know, even. No, no not at all, man. Like, and if you no. are, if you, if you come out trying to be that kind of guy, we're going to laugh at you. We're going to yeah. mock you. Well, that's and that's how, you know, these like fake guys on Twitter, that's how they end up outing themselves. It's being like that type of person. Yeah. Cause we're like 
tell us what what ODA were you on again, or mm -hmm. what group were you in? And that's like, oh, blah 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 blah. I, I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, nah, you're not. <laughs> nope, you didn't. No, it's it, it's good. It's good stuff. Uh, you know, I. Um, so before I go, there yeah. he is. Oh, big boy. He moved. He moved to the bed. Yeah, he's on the bed now. He's like, screw you, man. <laughs> So there he, he is. Moved. Nice. <laughs> My nice. man, Larry. Right, we can wrap it up. Terry, give everybody your social media coordinates where they can find you and let everybody know um, uh, what you got going on. Yeah. So obviously I'm on Twitter at Terry Shepard. And then uh, I don't really, I have an Instagram account. TP, I don't even, I'm an awful social media person. I'm, I'm lazy and I'm not that smart. You're very sporadic. I do start, I do start uh, in about a, well, a month and a half. Uh, and I'll be filming the whole month of May. We were, we got the contract. I'll be filming season five of Hollywood weapons. Um, so by the end of May, a whole, a whole season will be done. I'm looking forward to that. Cause they want to get that. They want to get that on. I think they're starving. Everyone's starving for content at this point. So I think they oh, want to yeah. get on this summer. So look for me on Hollywood weapons and you can find, you can find that on the internet. You can find my show, dude, you're screwed. Blah, blah, blah. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Matt, what do you got going on? Um, I'm just a book? My book endlessly still. Um, yes. So even if you haven't bought it, buy I gotta it. buy that, Matt. I'm sorry, I, I've been really remiss on that. I gotta, I'll pick oh. that up from Amazon. Cool. All right, sounds good. And then you know, everyone else, please follow his lead. I think I think Jesse Kelly needs to have you on. Uh, uh, I'm right on the first to talk about yeah, that book. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess you know now we know who I am, so that'll probably help with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, Matt Plummer, twelve. I'm um I'm doing this whole thing this month where I'm just. Do you know who Aaron Rupar is? Yes. Oh God. I'm just shitting on him every single day, nonstop. He deserves whole, it. Yeah, he does. Thread. It's called uh, Aaron Rupar owning himself, and I'm up to like fifty entries. It never ends. Um, doing very well. So keep an eye out for that. Oh, I guess that's the Urban Dictionary thing started from. All I saw was the Urban Dictionary thing, and I didn't know oh, what it was. Yeah, yeah, so there's now an Urban Dictionary definition of a rupar. It's a verb, which is to deliberately mislead. So, like, <laughs> you just rupar that whole, yeah, it, it works perfectly. He's so bad. I found, like, cases where, like, he would contradict himself within a day or within 12 hours on an issue. And I'm going, How, like, what is, is this, I mean, Normally, when you have contra you hear contradictory information, your brain recognizes it and c causes tension. You go, "Wait, how, how do I know which one's right?" I, I guess there's none of that, or he's really dishonest, which is probably more. Likely. I think it's what I think it's what it is. He's just yeah. Yeah. it's the latter. Yeah, absolutely. Well, either way, you're doing God's work. It's fantastic. <laughs> uh, Elisa, what do you got going on, and where can people find you? Um, I'm on Twitter at Lisa mm -hmm. the EP, and I have books on Amazon. Um, I can't imagine. Which are awesome. Awesome. <laughs> they are awesome. Um, and yeah, I can't imagine what Amazon would have to do. Um, it, it maybe short of like run out of my books that would make me boycott them. <laughs> but they might. It's possible. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's wrap it up. Uh, everyone make sure and subscribe to political punks on rumble and YouTube. I'll also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Please like, and share this video far and wide. And until next time, everyone keep the faith and stay frosty. Thank you.